We're in Mark chapter 10. We'll be looking starting at verse 13. We find from our study last week that Jesus was using a particular style of writing called paradox. A paradox is a statement that seems to contradict itself, and yet it expresses a valid truth or principle. For example, Paul wrote, For when I am weak, then I am strong. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 10. And in Mark chapter 9, there, verse 35, uh, we saw that the text there says, Sitting down, he called the twelve and said to them, If anyone wants to be first, he shall be last of all and servant of all. And so in our lesson today, Jesus is going to come back to that idea. When you look at the, the basic principle uh, that Jesus is teaching with this idea, um, you might look at it as Jesus is teaching the need for uh, a radical, sincere change in his disciples. He's called for them to, to put themselves last in service to others and to be willing to sacrifice for others. When you think about it, what we've already read, what was it that prompted Jesus to see a need to go into this topic? You think about what has been happening uh, along the way with his disciples, uh, and with his fame uh, and people coming from all over to see him, there is a natural tendency for them uh, to get caught up in that kind of enthusiasm. So he's going to continue talking about the paradox of what it means to be a disciple. Uh, and we'll be looking at how he uses little children today to do that. So if you will join me, let's look at verse 13 through 16, Mark chapter 10. And they were bringing children to him so that he might touch them, but the disciples rebuked them. When Jesus saw this, he was indignant and said to them, permit the children to come to me. Do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God, God belongs to such as these. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child will not enter it at all. And he took them in his arms, and he began blessing them, laying his hands on them. How is this topic that we're seeing here in Matthew 10, verse 13, connected to the previous topic where he talked about divorce? Do you see some connection there between that discussion uh, that he had with the disciples and this new one so far? What's the relationship, do you see, between talking about people in divorce and this sit situation here with little children. Hmm, yes? A lot of times divorce is because people can't uh, compromise. Uh-huh. And so little children have a much uh, easier time of compromising most of the time. <laughs> most of the time. <laughs> Thank you. The, and the idea here is that the key a uh, subject uh, that you brought up from the previous lesson, uh, and this here, and this one here, has a similarity. Under the, the, the discussion of divorce, you remember the certificate of divorce was, re, was written to do what? What was its primary purpose, do you recall? It was to protect whom? The woman, the wife, because in their culture, she had a few rights. She, for example, uh, it was difficult for her to be uh, supporting the family. If she got divorced, the certificate would allow her to find another husband because otherwise she'd have to go back to her parents and live. And so the law originally dealt with the fact that they were hard-hearted, abusing the relationship and not remembering what God had intended from uh, the beginning. So we have a similar idea here. We're going to come to, to the children who are also not very significant or important uh, in their culture. And so he's going to talk a, 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 a little bit about the same kind of ideas. The concern that we have for children in our uh, culture today, perhaps even more than years past, I don't know, also depends on whether you live in a city or a country uh, a little bit. But we have a different view, perhaps, of children than they did in their culture. So Jesus 
uh, comes back to this idea that he talked about in chapter 9, verse 42. So, and he's basically showing the importance and need uh, to respect both wives and children uh, and to, to cherish them. In our pr previous lesson, I mentioned to you that modern views of, of childhood, for that reason, are somewhat different. In their culture, how important was a child? Not very. There, there was usually a reason uh, for a king, you know how in England they had an heir and a spare, uh, to take the place of uh, the king if he were to die for some reason or got old and, and relinquished his control. And so there, of course, are reasons, uh, and I'm not saying that people didn't love their children, uh, they did, but they had no power, they had no authority, there was no influence uh, through them, and so they were seen as somewhat sig insignificant when it comes to position and power and, and prestige. So the disciples uh, are observing that, that people are bringing children to Jesus, uh, and they are looking and paying attention to, why are these people doing this? Why do people bring their children to Jesus? They wanted him to lay hands on them, which would be bestowing a blessing, you know, some benefit to them. And so they naturally wanted him, since he's providing benefits for all other kinds of people, to bless their children as well. And so they're bringing. Now, the disciples respond to that in what way? Yeah, rebuke. You know, if, he, if he's going to be the ruler of the world, who does he need to be talking to? Children? No, the powerful and influential. He needs to be dealing with the higher society, the people who can contribute uh, to this cause that they see Jesus having. And so uh, they're concerned and they tell the people, take their children and, and go away. The response of Jesus is, is not very favorable to, to their behavior. Um, they have perhaps missed the previous lessons about it is those people who can give you no benefit uh, that you need to be serving, that part of society that you can't gain anything from, we looked at last week. So when we're talking about Mark chapter 9 and how he used it, little children back there in that situation, um, you'll remember that, G that J John said to him, Teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tr tried to prevent him because he was not uh, following us. What was it that we saw in the disciples when they made that statement to Jesus? What's going on amongst them that, that's revealed by his words? What are they after? The elite. And they want to control. They want to have control over uh, who sees Jesus and, and, and what Jesus uh, does for people. So they're, they're wanting to control them because they're up there. They're managing so that the people who have access to him are going to be those people that would be helpful to a worldwide kingdom. They want to sort of be the gatekeepers. They decide who can see and who cannot see him. And that's why there's still a connection because they haven't learned from the previous experience. When Jesus saw what his disciples were doing to the parents and their children, what was his response? He was what? We have a word here that we don't... Indignant is the word we have here. Uh, if you have the New King James, it says greatly displeased. Maybe we don't use indignant very often, and so greatly displeased gives you the idea. Basically, indignant is a form of anger. They were angry, uh, but it's a sort of self-righteous uh, kind of, uh, of anger. So in verse 14, what did Jesus say about the children? Yes, he, he says the kingdom of heaven belongs to such such as these. And so he not only rebuked their, their behavior, but he pointed them to the um, future of the kingdom. If we ask ourselves, I mean, if we're being honest, have you ever seen children in public who were misbehaving and causing their parents a lot of trouble? You ex your, your children excluded, of course. 
<laughs> have you ever, I was one time in Sears in Renton and a little boy was having such a fit that everybody in that whole section of the store stopped, you know? Uh, and so, you know, the, the reason for, for bringing that up is to say that there are things about children um, that are not perfect. We're not saying that children are perfect and Jesus was not saying that either. But what he was pointing to is what they had as their priority in service. Children are not perfect. Children need help, they need to grow, they need opportunity to, to learn, they need people who will love them and, and help them. So he's not saying that they deserve the kingdom because they're so righteous. That's not what he's talking about. What the, the adults should look like is what those children represent. They're the um, unimportant, insignificant, little people, uh, literally and, and figuratively, of the culture. And they need the attention of Jesus' disciples. And he wants them not only to pay attention to children, but to those who are similar in their culture to, to children. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 3, Paul points us to this idea of littleness or humbleness. And he says, do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of, of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. So Jesus comes back to this subject. The little ones in society are easily uh, pushed aside because uh, they are weak and do not uh, fit the profile that those in leadership and power are looking for. But what does God say about weakness in the scripture? Do you remember anything? Ah, he does. His power is seen in weakness. Remember Paul would talk about that in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9? For my power is made perfect in weakness. He quotes him as saying, and so the, those people that we think are insignificant are our opportunity for God to show his power uh, and to take care of those that the culture is perhaps ignoring. The principle of salvation that maybe Jesus is pointing to needs to be discussed. Is he saying here that these children have earned salvation? No, he's not saying that at all. The principle that he's teaching over and over again is the disciples and those that they think are, are worthy of the, the important positions cannot earn their salvation either. Uh, salvation cannot be earned. It's not by human power. It's not by intelligence. It's not by life experience. Um, because powerful, influential, and skilled adults can find themselves opposing Jesus and might even be thinking, well, I've done a lot for God and, and can do more. Surely God wants me in his kingdom. Uh, and I don't know. You could ask Shirley and find out. But I'm guessing that he's not looking for someone to make the plan better or the kingdom better. Uh, he's already got the plan, and it's perfect. So emphasizing uh, not only in his lesson here to his disciples that salvation cannot be earned. It's not by uh, your physical birth. It's not by your education or your power or the money or your intelligence or any of that. Uh, Romans chapter 6, verse 23, Paul said, the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Why does he say free gift? Aren't all gifts free? <laughs> this is the challenge. Uh, sometimes a, a gift has a, uh, has a string attached to it. But in, in, in this particular case, he's emphasizing that salvation, eternal life, is not something that we can earn. Uh, it's something that is given to us. And of course, we are blessed to have eternal life in Christ Jesus. And we understand in Romans 6 verse 3 that we get into Christ through baptism. And so there is a, a plan that God has already made. In, in uh, 1 Peter chapter 3 verse 21, what is the power in baptism? Do you remember? Is it the water? 1 Peter 3 verse 21. We might want to take a look at that. Uh, 1 Peter 3 verse 21. 
Baptism, which corresponds to what he said about Noah and the ark, now saves you, not a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Baptism is not a work of man. It's a work of Jesus. His resurrection is the power uh, in baptism. But this is what we need to remind ourselves because God has set the plan. The power is always going to be in God. The earning is always going to be through him. And so in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, we're saved by what? Grace through faith. Grace through faith. And then he emphasizes not of works, but he doesn't say we don't do anything, right? Because God has created works for us to do. When God thought of you, he thought of, aha, this is something that person can do. And he will provide the opportunity and the gifts if you're willing uh, to be used by him. But these uh, disciples have a different idea. They think that the, the privileged few are going to determine who gets into the kingdom uh, and that they will be chosen on the basis of the standard that they set. And Jesus is saying, take a look at children. How much power do they have? How much influence do they have? And yet these are the kind of people, uh, the little people, the people who cannot do anything for you that you need to be paying attention to. So the children illustrate a truth about salvation, a truth that the disciples are having a difficult time getting uh, in touch with. So he goes on, having taught this two times already, chapter 9 and now here in chapter 10, is it a hard thing for people to assume that they cannot earn their salvation? Is that hard? See, I, I hear some people saying yes. We are a, a, a culture, maybe less and less so, but a generation of people who are wanting to do something, uh, to be engaged, to accomplish something, and sometimes it goes too far. Uh, and we begin thinking that we're a pretty good asset to God, and surely he wants us and he needs us in order for him to accomplish his goal. That's the wrong thinking. That was the idea of the disciples. They're needing to come to a different direction. And so in, in Mark chapter 10, something happens that helps them uh, to see this. And as you go through there, you'll see they're pretty much shocked by uh, the conversation that Jesus has. But in Mark chapter 10, 17 through 22, we have this rich person who's not really called rich in Mark, but we find him uh, referenced that way in the other Gospels. But he's not only rich, we find in the other Gospels that he's a ruler. So he's a person of position and, and authority as well as being uh, rich. So let's look at 17 through 22. As he was setting out on a journey, a man ran up to him and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and mother. As he said to him, Teacher, I have kept all these things from my youth up. And looking at him, Jesus felt a love for him and said to him, One thing you lack, go and sell all your possessions and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. But at these words, he was saddened, and he went away grieving, for he was one who owned much uh, property. So in verses 17 through 18, a man uh, ran up and knelt before him. What does his behavior or posture suggest? It suggests humble, doesn't it? He's respecting who Jesus is, uh, and he's coming to him and kneeling before him. It is Luke who calls him a ruler, and Matthew uh, says he's not only a ruler, but a young ruler. Mark says neither of these, only that he owned much uh, property. It is possible that there could be more than one person with this description, um, but it uh, makes sense even if it is just one person. What does the man who kneels before Jesus, what does he ask of Jesus in verse 17? What must I do to inherit eternal life? There is the do again, right? Uh, we're looking for to do, all right? Why would this be 
natural in the Jewish religion? Yes, oh, tons of stuff that you can do, right? Uh, their whole sacrificial system was a, was a doing thing, and it's not wrong to do. It's just what, it, what you think it means when, when you do this. And so he's asking, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? When he says, inherit eternal life, what's he talking about? He's basically talking about salvation, isn't he? Because he wants the life not limited to this world. But not only not limited to this world, um, but it is an eternal life with, uh, with God. We see that in some of the things that he, he, he mentions here. So he's looking for uh, what he's probably heard Jesus was teaching. Uh, Jesus went from town to town and said something about the kingdom. Do you remember? Kingdom of, yes? Yeah, the kingdom of God is at hand or is near. Yes. Yeah. I also think it's interesting here. He says, what must I do yeah. to inherit? Yes. You know, um, the, what yeah, do you do to inherit? inherit. Yeah. You're um, born. You're right? born, yeah. <laughs> and the, the owner of those possessions usually determines who gets it. Yes, usually. Yeah. Uh, I met a man from Texas who was a lawyer, and he said when his parents died, they, they had oil wells, and the children fought over it. He was a lawyer, and his parents had written a pretty good will uh, that was fa fair to all people. But sometimes people wanted more fairness. And so they all would inherit because they were children. And so uh, what do you do to inherit? Well, you're a child. How do you become a child is the question. What is a child here that's going to inherit? How do you become a child? Hmm. Yeah, you have to be born into the family. We have a spiritual birth. When we are united with Christ in baptism, we are born into the family as we come out of the water and are spiritually uh, resurrected. And so um, the natural thing uh, is to, to want to do something. What shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he, he introduced his question by saying, good teacher. All right. Apparently, that wasn't the best thing to do. <laughs> you know, in their culture, from what, what I read, um, rabbis didn't allow their followers to call them good. This word was reserved to describe God. And this person should have known that. He should have known as a rabbi he wouldn't have uh, taken the description good. Why do you suppose he might say that? Good teacher. I think he recognized that he was more powerful than the rabbis. Mm -hmm. he, had a, he had a position of more power, more honor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there was, there was something about Jesus' teaching that people recognized. There was something about his authority it was different. I mean, like Nicodemus came to him. Yeah. Recognized, if they were from God, you couldn't do these things. So. Yeah. And when he came in contact with people who had needs, what did he give them? Good things. He gave them good things. So th this would be natural. Uh, and if you're wanting an audience and a favor from this particular person, you might acknowledge that. Okay. Uh, sometimes people acknowledge those kind of things for what reason? We have a word for it, right? Flattery. We like to flatter them. Uh, and sometimes, you know, people who have a really sensitive ego, it, it does flatter them. But Jesus said what to him? Why do you call me good? The word good, Jesus tells him, the rabbis were correct on one thing at least. The, the word good should be reserved for God. Okay, did, did Jesus say he was not good? So what's he challenging this person to consider? Does he really know who Jesus is and how appropriate? It would be to call him good because he says, call no man good. Uh, and yet, in fact, we, we know that he's not just a man. For no one is good except God's, God alone. Now you go back to, he's teaching them, he's teaching his disciples and anyone else who happens to be around, that you cannot earn your salvation. You cannot, by your good deeds, obligate God to save you. We're saved by what? Grace through faith. And it was a little hard for, for 
you, you know, him to get that Moses law idea out of their head. So he keeps pursuing it. After correcting the, the man's use of good, what does Jesus tell him to do in verse 19? Look at verse 19. What does Jesus tell him to do? Yeah, he, he says, you know the commandments, and he could probably fairly assume that anybody in that, that person's position would know the commandments. Which commandments is he referring to? Old Testament. And, and if you write Ten Commandments in Microsoft Word, it wants to capitalize them. <laughs> because it was a significant summary of the law of Moses. And so if you take the law and the ten verses, the first four refer to whom? They refer to God. The last six refer to whom? Others. So there are two sections in the Ten Commandments. Uh, the first part referring to God, for example, you shall have no what? No other God before you. And he adds to that you shall not make for yourself graven image or an idol. And so he, that part has to do with who you identify as God. Uh, and then he says, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Oh, okay. When I first went to Slovakia, I was on the, the bus and I had very minimal Slovak language. We were in school and I kept hearing people say, Jesus and Mary, Jesus Maria. And I'm going, wow. They are really spiritual here. Uh, until I found out, guess what? They were swearing. Uh, and I'm going, oh, I'm glad I didn't ever use that. Didn't ever learn to use that. I heard it. So you should not take the name your, your Lord God in vain. And that has been understood in, in many circles as a reference to not properly using God's name or using it as a curse term or something of that nature. But that's the third commandment. Don't do that. And then the fourth one is remember what? Sabbath. Okay. The Sabbath is the seventh day. We know it as Saturday. We know it as Saturday. Uh, and so he doesn't focus on that in, in his gospel. He doesn't say them in order either. He goes sixth commandment, seventh commandment, eighth commandment, ninth commandment, fifth commandment. Okay. And he doesn't mention the tenth one. So Jesus asks him about, um, you know, the commandments. He's, he said, good teacher, what shall I do to inherit, inherit eternal life? And so Jesus turns to, to, to him and answers, besides, um, don't call me good. No, no one is good except God alone, alone. Or why do you call me good is, is a better way. Because that's what he asked. Do you realize what you're saying? like calling me good. And then he says, you know the commandments, and he, he lists them there. Do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear fault with, false witness, do not fraud, defraud, and honor your father and your mother. So what did the, the young rich ruler say in response to that? I've been doing that. I got that. Those are checked off on my uh, list of t things to do today. Uh, and he... Uh, very likely, was sincere. What, what gives you a clue that might suggest he was sincere? Look at verse 21. What happens well, in verse 21? Yeah, the, uh, well, I was going to say in verse 20, he says, all these I've kept since I was a boy. I mean, he's, he's aware of them. He says, I've, I've been doing this my whole life. Yes, so. he's kept those. He acknowledges he's done this his whole life. And so why, why would someone listening, especially Jesus, Take it to be sincere. Yeah. Well, he said, it says that he looked at him and loved him and ah. said, you were lacking only one thing. Okay, so he looked at him, and the word look means like a stare. You know, that's a steady look. He looked at him, and, and Jesus loved him, which suggests he found that to be sincere, what the young man was saying. This is the, the word agape, and he acknowledges uh, in his mind, we have uh, Mark writing for us, um, that he felt love for him. So he said to him, one thing you lack. Does he list the one thing he lacks? No, 
He doesn't tell him one thing. What does he tell him? Yeah, he gives him a, a, a list of things to do here. He says, go and sell all your possessions, give to the poor, you will have treasure in heaven, come and follow me. He told him four things. So he didn't tell him what the one thing was that he lacked. He told him four things he could do. Remember, he asked, what can I do? And he says, okay, here's what you can do. If we think about it, you know, and we're looking at verse uh, 21 to know Jesus' reaction. Um, if he was faithfully keeping the commandments, how would he view what Jesus told him? If he was faithfully in his heart keeping the commandments, what about those four things? Yes? Um, he had an, the thing I would say is he had an idol, and his idol was wealth. Okay, so we find out what the one thing is by his response to what Jesus asked him to do. To do. If he's sincere, Jesus is asking him to do basically what he's asked the other disciples to do. When he called Matthew and, and Andrew uh, and Peter, what did they do? They gave up what they were doing. They left. They were working on boats, as, as we find out. Yes? So in this, if that had been somebody else that came to him, he might have had four different things to check off the list, right? I mean, it's not... Exactly. Because he, obviously, this, this ruler, or rich young man, yeah, he valued his possessions so much. Yeah. It doesn't mean that, you know, somebody living here, you know, I mean, most of the world would see us as wealthy, Right. From our standards locally, let's say, we're, we don't feel that way. Okay. Right? And, and would Jesus come here and say, well, you all are lacking okay. this one thing? Or, you know, would it be different for each person? I'm, I'm assuming. This is, a good, this is a good question. And, and what, what, what do you think? Yes? He failed the first commandment, which was, <laughs> thou shalt have no other gods before, because wealth was his God. Okay, so we got two things going on here. One uh, is his uh, problem with money. And the other one is he failed the first commandment. And you, you might find it that he failed the second commandment. Yes. Oh, that's what you're going to say? Okay. So what, what were... Oh. Yes, Gene? Well, I was also wondering if maybe he failed the 10th commandment. Do ah. not covet. covet. He okay. left that out. I mean, listen, all the ones that deal with others... He left out the one about do not covet. Okay. And I'm wondering if that was contributing to his riches and his wanting to hold on to because he wanted what other people have. Well, and this is really a challenge of reality. Some of these problems come together. All right. Now, the coveting, um, some of the, the writers over time have said it's similar um, to, to defrauding because they might defraud for the sake of Coveting. What does defraud mean, by the way? Do you use that word? Take yes, take advantage. All right, it's like cheating. Someone I, I heard him say. So uh, sometimes that's how that people got wealthy by taking advantage. Maybe not outright cheating, um, but in the temple courtyards they sold um, sacrifices at a very high price because the people were trapped. They had probably brought their own animal that they had raised. The people inspected it and said, nope, it's not good enough. Then they were forced to buy one. And of course, they paid a higher price. So this tenth one uh, probably was part of the challenge of uh, wealth. When people are starting to learn about Christ and, mm -hmm. and what they need to do, I think everybody has something they have to give up. Okay. Some people are so set in it that they don't know how, and they're yeah. afraid that, I think they're afraid they'll fail mm -hmm. by having to give that up, that they won't be able to, you know, yeah. do what Christ expects of them. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's harder for them to cross that boundary and get out of that. Yes. That, that's really a, a serious problem with people. And I've met people, even in this community, who said they couldn't come here because they weren't good enough to be with these people. And I said, you just don't know them as well as I do. <laughs> yes. 
Yeah, just like you said, all of us have something that we're working on, or perhaps we'll discover we need to. Yeah, yeah. So, but anyway, the idea is the Ten Commandments, you know, they're all circling him. Uh, he, they're all going around him, but he has what idea in his head? He's a, he's a perfect candidate for, for Jesus. He's kept them from, from his youth. And, and though Jesus doesn't tell him what the one thing is that he's neglected, it turns out maybe there are several one things here that he had neglected because what is idolatry defined as in the New Testament? Greed, anything, yes? I think you were just gonna answer it. Go ahead. <laughs> anything that pulls you away from God and takes your focus more than him. Yes, anything that takes you away from God and is your focus rather than, than him. And so he's, he's showing by his reaction some problem with idolatry. So, you know, Jesus' disciples are over there watching. And when this guy came up, they're all probably thinking what? Wow, we're gonna get a pile of money out of this guy and he knows how to do things, you know? Oh my goodness, they were just so excited. And then he stumbles and uh, things are starting to go downhill and they're probably in a panic behind him watching what Jesus uh, is doing. Uh, when it comes, to what this man was trusting in, he revealed it uh, by his reaction. Just before we go on, let's, let's mention in verse 21, is what Jesus told this man to do found anywhere else in the Bible? That you must sell all your possessions, give to the poor. Does the scripture say that? Hmm? The principle is in the Bible, which is if you something is between you and your salvation, you need to get that fixed. But the sell all your that you have is not a, a demand of all Christians. Yes, this is exactly the idea because he's already dealt with it to the extent that if your hand causes you to stumble, do what? Cut it off. So it was a serious question of what's getting between you and God. If it's your money, then it's true today as it was then. But this wasn't a, a, a general requirement. It was a specific one. He asked and he needed to know, yeah? Well, I was gonna say, Paul writes in 1 Timothy 6 about you know, command those who are rich not to put their hope in their riches, but in God, exactly. be generous with what they have, yes. and build up treasure in heaven. He didn't tell them, sell it all. No, this was the point. And you remember in the book of Acts, when uh, what was it Ananias and Sapphira? Ananias came in and told the apostles he'd sold this land and given them all the money for it. The problem that he had is that the apostles had the Holy Spirit, and they knew that that was a lie, okay? And so he, when he lied, he, he died. You know, he was struck by God, and he died. And then, sometime later, guess what? Safi comes in, and they ask her, is this all the money you had? This, you gave everything? Oh, yeah, yeah, and guess what? Well, they came in and carried her out as well. And so the people who were watching got a lesson. Yes, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, even in that interaction, it says, if you had just told us up front you were keeping half of it, mm -hmm. there would have been no problem. Like yes. you, that was yours to keep. But instead, you wanted to appear greater. Than yes. You this is, this is the, the key point that people were watching and learning. They didn't have to give all their money. It was their money. And they were free to give. If they wanted to give part, they could. And so this was the, the whole idea uh, in the particular situation that uh, we see here. Now, he got a stricter one because he is looking for uh, responsibility and he needed to be challenged and what really was going on in his life. It's, it says here in verse 22, if you look there, but at these words of Jesus, he was saddened. The word in the Greek is to become somber or gloomy in appearance. And, and so you have the idea in NIV, his, his face fell. You know, it's like you could, you could see that this was something he had not even considered. It had not even come across 
uh, the radar with him. And so um, after his facial expression revealed what was going on inside, he went away grieving. And the scripture says why? He had great wealth. He had a lot of money. And so when we come back to what several of you had said, apparently the man's core issue was um, wealth was an idolatry. Uh, the Jews had a tradition. The tradition was, you are wealthy for what reason? God loves you, and that's the reason you're wealthy. And if a, if a tower falls on you, it's because... God doesn't love you. Remember, Jesus had to rebuke them for those thoughts, but it was common in their culture. And so the disciples are also falling into that pattern of thinking that way. And, and Jesus keeps presenting to them a, a, a period of discussion, an observation, something that helps them to get the real uh, meaning. And so this was a pretty dramatic stuff. They're all there holding their breath, thinking, wow, we're, we're going to be rolling in the dough. And Jesus keeps making it worse. You know, as I can imagine Peter was just about to raise his hand and say, could we move on to getting the money uh, and, and forget all this uh, stuff? Pardon me? Uh, Judas. Judas, too. Yes, yes, especially Judas. He probably was having a heart attack. Uh, <laughs> but what we want to see here is the man ultimately had a problem with uh, idolizing wealth. He'd perhaps assumed that because he was wealthy that he, that he was approved by God. And that was a, a mistake. And so they go on. In the end there, chapter 10, verse 23 through 27, not actually the end, but the next section, and, and Jesus, looking around, said to his disciples, how hard it will be for those who are wealthy to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were amazed at his words, but Jesus answered again and said to them, children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. They were even more astonished and said to him, then who can be saved? And looking at them, Jesus said, with people it is, it is impossible, but not with God, for all things are possible uh, with God. What caused the disciples to be so amazed? What did Jesus say in teaching them here that caused them to be so amazed? It's hard for what? Uh, now, there are two things. He says it's hard for a rich man to get into heaven, but he ultimately went down and changed it to what? Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. For whom? Everybody by works. Yes, sir. Well, and I might be jumping ahead. He, it, with man, this is impossible. If you are relying on yourself and your wealth to get into heaven, it's impossible. It's mm -hmm. only through God you're going to get, which is what you were talking before about. It's by grace through faith. Yes. It's not about anything we do. It's about our trust and faith in him. This is an important idea that they need to have. They, they really can't go forward uh, in the, the work of the kingdom until they understand this. They, they've got to know that people of position or priority by the world standards are not going to have an advantage in getting into heaven. And he's taught that so many times. And that's what he's bringing to their attention here. The disciples were amazed because he said how hard it is for the wealthy to enter the kingdom of God. And then he goes on and says, well, it's, it, it's hard to enter the kingdom of God, period, if you're depending on what? Yourself and your ability to be righteous or a good woman or a good man. If that's what you're depending upon, it's impossible. Uh, and then he said something in verse 25 that probably gave them you know, a near heart failure. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Well, how easy is it for a camel to go through an eye of a needle? It, he's saying it's impossible here. Now, a lot of people don't like what Jesus said. They don't like hyperbole. They don't like this style of exaggeration for the sake of making your point. And so you know what they have done over the years? They said that one of the gates into Jerusalem was called the eye of a needle because it was smaller. 
and only the little tiny short camels could get in, or if they got down on their knees uh, and kind of waddled through. There's no record in history that that is true. Why are we trying to take away the power of what Jesus said? If your focus is money, guess what? It's going to be hard as as uh, it is for a camel to get through the eye of a needle if you want to get into heaven. The, the point that he made, made shouldn't be diminished because we're embarrassed by it. Uh, Jesus knows what a needle is. He knows what a camel is. Uh, and he said it the way he said it for a reason so that we would get in our, in our minds. We cannot earn our salvation. There's nothing that we can do uh, apart from the, the grace of God and the blood of Jesus to be saved. His disciples needed to know that. There's no handing money under the table and getting into the kingdom. This is not the way uh, it's, it's going to work. So they're asking who can be saved? What hope does Jesus give his disciples in verse 27? With people it's impossible, but not with God. For all things are possible with God. Uh, if God is involved, this is going to be the solution. We need to find out what he said, uh, and whatever we, we must believe or do, believe and do what he said, because the power then is not in us. The righteousness is not in us. Uh, Paul wrote to the Romans and said, the righteousness that saves is which righteousness? The righteousness of God, the righteousness of Christ, yes. I think he used the needle, though, as, as a part of an example, because part of them were tent makers, part of them were fishermen. So some of them knew how to mend nets and make tents. So yeah. they understood that eye of the needle. Yeah. It wasn't very big. No, that would be, especially the fishermen, they're always repairing their nets. In fact, we, we, we read of them doing that. And so this was a common tool, and the impossibility of it would become very plain to them. That was a, uh, a good illustration that Jesus used. I guess we shouldn't be surprised that he does that. In looking at what he says in verse 27, what makes it possible for God to save the rich and the poor? What is it that makes it possible for God to save the rich and the poor? It's all about trusting in God. Yes. Right, not in themselves. This is the whole idea. It's the same. They, they are trusting in God and, and receiving from him grace and mercy. So it's not impossible since he has done what? What has he done that makes it possible? Paid the price for everybody's sins. Yes, he paid for the price of our sins. That's already been done. And, and so that's the thing that makes it possible. But God initiated that, yeah? Yeah, I was also going to say, and, you know, looking at this a little bit more too, what you've kind of brought out, I mean, they were amazed in verse 24 when he said how hard it is for rich to enter the kingdom of God. Your comments about for the Jews, they felt a rich man was being blessed by God. And so, the, and so Jesus says, it's going to be hard. So, Whoa, that's pretty hard. And then he goes on and gives that example about the other camel. They're even more amazed. Says, yes. Whoa. <laughs> he, he, he's giving it to them yeah. pretty fast he and is, furious yeah. here, that making it as plain as he can, that apart from God, it's not possible. And they need to get that in their minds. No matter how rich a person is, they're not going to get themselves uh, into heaven. I read something by David Garland. He wrote in a commentary, This encounter with the rich ruler helps explain the disciples' persistent failure in the story here. No one enters the kingdom by his or her own strength. Who can deny himself completely? Who can sell all that he or she has? They're not able to deny themselves 100% or to, uh, to sell everything they have in a realistic situation. So there has to be something about it's not what you do. Giving oneself completely over to God seems impossible, but Jesus did not need to die on the cross for something that everyone could do easily. Uh, he died on the cross because we can't do it uh, easily. Uh, but some of these things we can call, we can do. So uh, the, the, the other disciples had made a variety of sacrifices in order to be where they were. You have Matthew who was rich because he was what? Tax collector. And he was the manager of tax collectors. 
uh, and you had fishermen who were uh, probably wealthy because they had a good business, they owned their own boats, and they're needing to see before they go on to the next challenges that salvation is by grace through faith. There's no advantage you have by being rich. In fact, it could be what? A, a, yes, it could be detrimental, depending on where your heart uh, and your mind is. Okay, we're, we're finished. Uh, well, Lord willing, come back to verse 28 find out how the, the apostles react to this. He has to deal with their reaction, and he has an opportunity to do that. If you would, please join me, and we'll close in prayer. Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity to, to see your disciples. And Father, so often we see ourselves in them, and we know uh, we have hope because you were patient and persevered with them and provided, uh, as you, you do for all people, mercy and grace, that we might come to know you, to know your Son, and find a salvation in him. We're grateful that he was willing to be a part of this plan, to give uh, his life, to give his blood, that our sins could be taken away. Help us, Father, as we take this message to um, uh, apply it as the apostles were told to apply it, so that we uh, will be able to help people see they don't have to be perfect b before they come to you. They, they just need to come to you to find uh, cleansing and perfection through the life of of your son and his blood. Help us, Father, as we uh, seek to, to grow, to trust in you and not in ourselves. We pray this in your son's name. Amen.